living in an age where the customer sees everything a brand does, or someone who says something a brand does. Um, the internet, social media, blogs, SMS, Twitter, all of this has created a lot of noise, but a lot of transparency. So we're here in our respective fields here at Globe talking about sustainability. But does that word need to be redefined to bring in a, a bigger idea of what it means? We think of sustainability often as greenhouse gases and uh, measuring and saving energy and being more efficient. But isn't it something bigger? Is it a bigger idea uh, about acting differently, thinking differently in new and better ways? And really, the question I think we're going to ask today here in the panel is, can business with a purpose just be good business? Um, probably wondering why I'm putting Guinness beer up on the screen here a little early in the day. Um, I worked with uh, Guinness when I lived in New York. And I thought it was really interesting from the, the consumer insights and research that 92% of the people said they either love or like Guinness. So the badge rating or the affinity rating was really high. But when you actually got to the consumption, it was 8% actually drink it. And, and I think of that often with sustainability. There's a lot of great conversations. There's a lot of great talk. But how do you change behavior? That's a whole different thing. How do you make sustainability easier for your customers, for stakeholders, uh, for people who want to do something, but it's, it's complex? How do we communicate these issues? Um, so these, these are the kinds of questions that our panel today is going to discuss, and I'm really looking forward to this, and I hope you are. So I'd like to start by um, introducing you to John Battelle, our moderator. He's the co-founder of Wired Magazine and the chairman and CEO of NUCO, whose mission is to identify, celebrate, and connect the engines of positive change in our society. So please welcome John Battelle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, guys. There's a lot of women having lunch somewhere, I heard. Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to bring up our panel. Uh, guys, you can just sort of trickle on here while I tell you who they are. Um, uh, to my immediate left, once he gets here, is Rich Mikus. Uh, he is the CMO of Telco Media Energy Utilities at IBM. Previously, he was the VP of Smarter Cities. How many of you remember that campaign, the Smarter Cities campaign? Really awesome work. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, so this is Rich. Rich is here. Um, and to Rich's left is uh, Joey Bergstein. Now, um, he's the CMO of Seventh Generation. You're probably familiar with Seventh Generation if you have laundry. Um, and uh, uh, <clears throat> he's been with Seventh Generation, as I recall, since 2011. Is that correct? That's right. And he hails from Vermont, where Ben, Jerry, and Bernie are uh, 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 call it home as well. And then. At the left here is uh, Nelson Switzer. Now, now, Nelson's been at Nestle for all of six weeks. Eight weeks. Eight weeks. That's <laughs> another 33%. Um, eight weeks, but has been involved in sustainability uh, on a corporate level and as a consultant um, for 20 years, I think you Almost, told me. Yeah. Um, uh, but he's chief sustainability officer at Nestle Waters North. Gentlemen. <laughs> um, I'm not planning on taking any calls. I just wanted to make sure I knew what time it was. Um, so <laughs> let's get to it. I, I think, first of all, let me set this up. Um, there's a reason that uh, these folks uh, are here and their, their backgrounds are so varied. When you're talking about brand and sustainability, um, there's a lot that comes into play. First of all, there's obviously straightforward brand marketing, and we have two brand marketers here. Um, but there's also an informational element that seems to be quite complicated, uh, evinced by the Guinness example before. And so having Rich here to discuss um, the idea of insights and data as crucial in a, in a new era of not just sustainability, but of brand marketing generally. Um, and then to speak to the uh, frustrations and um, uh, you know, opportunities of, of the sustainability department at large companies. Um, we have Nelson. 
Um, and we, it's a sort of a combination of data insights, marketing, and sustainability practice that um, I think we want to get into. There are going to be microphones. As a matter of fact, I'm told that there's a microphone that people can throw around and catch. Um, so good luck with that out there. <laughs> um, but first, we'll have a bit of a conversation. I'm curious. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of brand marketing. I think it's an awesome and interesting practice, and I've been involved in it on the publisher side for uh, over two decades. Um, but I'm curious how the practice of brand marketing, which really grew up under a mass consumer kind of product, placement, positioning kind of approach, has changed in the last four or five years as the idea of sustainability has really taken root, particularly with a new generation of consumers. Has brand marketing changed because of sustainability? I'll let any of you take that. I'm happy to jump in. I have a feeling, Joey, you're going to say yes, given your brand is entirely about sustainability. <laughs> but we've been at it for over 25 years. Right. So you know, I think we've been doing very similar things for, um, for the past 25 years. I, you know, I think marketing continues to evolve. Transparency is such a, it's such a different world of transparency out there right now that consumers really have the power to learn everything about your brand. And being clear, being transparent is so much more important today than it was even 10 years ago where it was more difficult for people to find out what was really you know, inside a product, for example. Um, and I think that's, that's really shifted the power and shifted responsibility onto marketers to be um, clear with consumers about what it is they're selling, create products that are true to what they're promising because the consumer is going to find you out. Um, I think one of the things that I've just found amazing in the last few years is just the power of consumer reviews. I remember as an ABM at P&G in the early 90s, I remember going through a piece of research and you know, the first question in the research was, what influenced your decision? And the number one response was always uh, a friend. And you'd be like, eh, okay, whatever, there's not much I can do about that. You know? So friend, how many, you got everybody's friends to talk about a product. Well, you fast forward 20 years later and you know, reviews just drive businesses, you know, for the better or for the worse. Um, and again, I think that comes right back to, to transparency and just the availability of information that's out there today. Do you guys believe that consumers are now actually making purchase decisions based on that information, particularly information that relates to sustainability? Is that happening? I mean, it, it's your whole business, so yeah. forgive me for... <laughs> But is that happening at Nestle? Is that happening, you know, and, and if so, how? Well, I mean, I can certainly say that from what I have experienced thus far, it's a reason why some may choose not to buy products, um, probably more so than those who do choose to buy products. And I find it actually quite a compelling um, piece of data that needs to be unwound. Because when I think, of, and I'm not a brand marketer, but um, although perhaps we all are in our own rights, but. Um, you know, when I think about the notion of what are people buying and why are they making decisions, how do they make decisions, because really that's, that's what I consider my job to be, is, is about trying to provide the information that is going to empower people to make better decisions, decisions that are going to help create net value, whether it's environmentally, socially, or economically. And when it comes to selling a product or purveying a product or trying to communicate the aspects of a product, and Joey touched on this, People make decisions based on a whole bunch of factors. Cost, of course, is still a major, major factor because it's something that some people cannot control. Many people have no control over. But there are other aspects around the values that that product shares. Do they share the same value? Does the company share that same value? Does the product share the same value? Does it represent it? Does it help them achieve their goals? Does it empower them in some way? And that's something. But the, the, something that I've seen is that notion of authenticity. Beyond, and I think sustainability, like so many other, you know, whatever the, the generational brand tool has been that came before, it comes down to people understanding what authenticity is, what people believe it is, whether it's transparency, whether it's values, whether it's purpose. And then there's an, I don't know if I'd say obligation, but there's, I think, a compulsion to demonstrate how authentic you are in order for people to understand your product, trust your product, and trust you. Because if they trust you, they will probably want to buy from you or be more likely to. 
I want to get back to the idea, because it just sparked a thought, in terms of the role of the sustainability officer. So let me ask the audience, how many of you out there say, consider marketing to be most or, or all of your job? Okay, so it looks like about 20%. And then uh, I imagine the rest, or many of you, work in sustainability in some way, right? That's about 40%. Um, I'm curious how the two are working together and if the two. So let me throw out some really sort of dumb publisher guy, um, you know, uh, sort of cliches. Sustainability doesn't have a budget. Sustainability is always begging for uh, marketing to pay attention to them and listen to them. Um, and maybe sustainability is really an internal marketer to get everyone else to pay attention to this thing so that the company can move. Are these cliches true or are they false? Let, let, me, let me jump in on that. Uh, so at IBM, we, gosh, 25 years ago, we said we're environmentally committed in everything we're doing with regard to whether it's recycling, how we make things, how we dispose of things, whatever the case may be. Uh, and clearly there were people at the time that were overseeing those activities to be sure that we would do that because back to brand, that's not something you can say if you don't do, right? And our brand, in time, inside of IBM, people say the eight bar logo, it's, it's something to be protected. Um, the thing that works for us and that works in a lot of new initiatives or important initiatives is over time to integrate that into what everybody's doing. If you have it as a separate thing for a very long time, it just becomes, as you were suggesting, perhaps something that's underfunded, uh, not, not to use a plan words, and it isn't sustainable by itself because it's not baked into the fabric of the operation. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's, that's what we see with, with many new things, in, in including sustainability and in environmental initiatives and so forth. Right. In an era, though, I mean, the, the truth is that, you know, marketers and brand managers have to make their numbers mm -hmm. quarter to quarter to quarter. And it's, it, it's a grind. Um, and in that environment, I mean, have you, in your 20 years or so of working in the field, have you run into examples where the sustainability efforts get uh, pushed aside or neglected? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I've certainly seen it um, both for companies I have worked for in the past, but also you know, companies that I have advised over, over the years. And as a matter of fact, as a f you know, former consultant, uh, I can tell you, I mean, we see that in the rise and fall of revenue. Right? The amount of business that comes our way tends to be a function of, um, you know, what people, are, you know, the, the economy and how well it's doing, but also um, sometimes the, the fact is, is that companies bring these services internally, in-house, so that they're not going out uh, for consultants. But th there's, there's a couple of pieces that you touched on that I, I want to jump back to. One is that notion of, the, you know, the sustainability team, you know, sort of, doesn't have the budget or is looking for, um, needs partners. And I think that's probably true for almost any function within an organization. You know, you need to have partners. It's about relationships that you build in order to magnify the impact of what it is you want to achieve on behalf of the company. Because I think you probably all have the same end goal in mind. Enhance profitability, reduce cost, reduced impact, and, and, and uh, environmental impact or anyway, and so on. But I, I think that the, what is unique about it is and what might control or influence that is where within the organization a function like sustainability is situated. If you are situated within the communications team, um, then I would ask, is that the priority of this organization, to communicate a message? If you are uh, within, let's say, uh, you know, engineering, is that because your biggest impact and the biggest issue you have is in, uh, you, you have to manage your footprint? So it really depends where the impacts of that organization are, principally, and where that function might be focused. Now, sometimes it may be distributed across all of them, but as we all know, in any corporation, the corporate is another silo unto itself with all of the other business units as well. Um, so it's a difficult one to break through. But I don't know if I'd say that it disappears in the time of. Um, certainly, I, th I have seen many other functions at the same time. So when times are tough, it's not just sustainability that has rolled back, it's others. Um, I've never seen where it's disappeared. As a matter of fact, with the last downturn, I would say uh, it was probably one of the least disinvested 
areas uh, in the companies that, that I was advising at that time. Uh, and probably because they saw it as it's no longer a, you know, a, a, a nice to do, it's a must to do for so many reasons, which I'm sure Joey can talk about wh why it's a must do, because I don't want to take up all the airtime. <laughs> Well, I'll let you respond, Joey, because yeah. I'm, I'm in a previous conversation, you, you did mention that you thought, I mean, Seventh Generation is a company which is its entire brand, all of its values are around sustainability. Absolutely. Um, and that when you look at a company that's 150, 175 years old, those companies were not inculcated with a DNA around sustainability. How, and you said you worked at P&G, a very good example, and there's probably the very, you know, an opposite example of, you know, they're, they're at scale. They probably look at what you're doing and say, that's very nice that seventh generation can be so transparent. But we have a business to run. We're not breaking any laws. You know, we got to make a lot of tide, man, <laughs> right? So h how do you change that culture or is that possible? Yeah, I think the question is whether or not sustainability is core to the business model. And I think if, it, if it's sitting to the side of the business model, I, I think it's always going to be a struggle for it to get attention. And it's easy to say, I mean, our business was built around sustainability. We've got a really clear mission. It's about inspiring a consumer revolution that nurtures the health of the next seven generations. So our business, our mission drives our business, and the growth of our business drives our mission, and it's a really nice virtuous circle. And you know, everybody in the company has a hand in sustainability. There's no real sustainability department. You know, the 145 employees of seventh generation are the sustainability department. And that's a, a whole, that whole ecosystem works because, um, because the business model is all about doing better in the world. And, you know, I think if I you know, think back to experience I've had in the large companies I've worked with where that isn't what the business is about, um, I, think it, I think it's difficult. Um, until you know, there's either an edict from the CEO that says this is really critical to us. But even then, I think it has to be braced in a way where people understand, okay, well, here's how that is going to drive and grow our business um, so that it doesn't become an optional thing that you decide to invest in or don't decide to invest in. Well, doesn't this, Rich, raise the question of how do you get the insights and the data to prove that a, a pivot or, sorry, I'm using a Silicon Valley term, a transition to um, a core sustainability premise in the business model. You need to look into so many systems that have bad data, dirty data, no data, conflicting data in order to prove to the C-suite and the board this is the right direction to go. There's, there's a couple of things. The, the, first, the first to the former question has to do with is it important? And at IBM, for example, we in the manufacture of computers, spent a significant amount of time doing things that were very practical because the data said the computers are too hot, they use too much power, they, they make the, the computer room you know, uninhabitable. Uh, we designed our computers to be green, right? So we designed our computers to use orders of magnitude less power, less energy, air cool them instead of water cool them so that you don't have to d deal with the disposable water. Uh, disposing of the water. And all of that became critically important because it drove down costs where we needed to be because the market would dictate how much it was willing to pay for something. Now, with that is, to your second point, the inculcation of all of this data. Data has moved to the center of every operation. And without being able to get at the data that's being produced, and that data can be produced overtly, and therefore we know what to look for, and we know what to ask, and we know what to inspect, or it's unstructured data that's all over the enterprise and even in the companies and customers and ecosystems that you operate with, this data may reside. And to find that requires a whole new level of investment in cognitive technologies, which is, you know, we'll get to that, which is what we're doing. But it's about evolving our brand. So we've been around 100 years, but we've had imperatives that have been mandated not by the top of the business, but by the marketplace. Nobody wanted to buy big water-cooled computers anymore. People mm -hmm. don't want to buy software licenses anymore. They want to buy it in the cloud. They want... So you have to adjust your brand because at the end of the day, you have to create belief. You have to get people to act. And then that's how you create advocates. 
if you can create advocates, then you're back to the very first question, mm -hmm. which is how does a customer see all of this? Mm -hmm. So then I'm, I'm proud to associate with Seventh Generation or Nestle or IBM. I'm an advocate for Amazon Prime mm -hmm. or Starbucks because I find it essential. And that's you know, the end game. But if you're not making investments along the way that are necessary, these things will fall to the side. You know, that, that reminds me of the, um, the work that was done, I think it was by Bain and Company, developing the net performance statistic. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing, which goes to that notion of the, the third party or the advocate. And it's one question that is issued to their consumers. Would you recommend me to friends or family? Right. That's the only question that seems to matter, right? If you would provide a reference on my behalf that is far more valuable to me than the many millions of dollars I may spend on marketing. So that's where I should put my energy, which is in building that customer trust, that customer loyalty, so I do have a, um, an, an army of advocates to help empower my brand. You know, I, we, here with Seventh Generation, you've got a specialist who built the business on sustainability, but I'm, I'm curious for the, all three of you, um, the, the ability to go to market with a story around sustainability is one thing. Whether or not it's the right thing to do is another. And particularly with large companies, the, the, there seems to be a hesitation for fear of backlash. Um, uh, we were talking about some of the water projects that Nestle's been involved in that, that, that you know, when you listen for 10 or 15 minutes, you go, wow, that's amazing work you guys are doing. It really is. Um, but number one, you don't have 10 or 15 minutes with every consumer. Of course not. Uh, and number two, um, there are very loud advocates who um, will counter every point you make uh, to, to the extent which you probably, you would see it as dangerous to go to market with a sustainability story. Will that ever change? Well, I, I certainly don't see it as, as I mean, and you make, you're right, it's a good point. Um, I don't think, and again, my, my, my short tenure, mm -hmm. uh, if you can even call it a tenure after eight weeks at Nestle. Um, <laughs> but, you know, from what I've seen, and because I was consulting with them for, for, you know, the last six or eight months, one of the reasons that they have been around for 150 years is because they were rooted in providing a service that humanity required. There was a need for a supplement. This gentleman developed a supplement in Germany, uh, pardon me, in Switzerland. Um, and, and the company grew from there quite substantially in leaps and bounds. And the, the mission of the company of, is, of course, about helping people meet their nutrition needs, healthy hydration, for example. The, the, so the, the whole premise of the company is around the notion of sustainability, but I think that the the thing is, and I think I mentioned this earlier, is how it's couched from conversation to conversation, from decade to decade, and from generation to generation, maybe even seven generations. <laughs> but it's that notion, really. Right? First, it started off as, as a, health, a healthy supplement for mothers who could not provide for their, their newborns, and, and moving on from there, and all of these other products that are there to provide people health. That, to me, is a huge social purpose. It's fulfilling a need. And frankly, that's what businesses were originally supposed to you know, be based around. It's meeting the services that, that the community needs that the community cannot provide for itself. And I think that there's a, been, a, of course, as we all know, a grand shift in the purpose of many companies, whether the purpose is growth or the purpose is profit or the purpose. And that's a difficult you know, scale you, to stand you, on. You mentioned that when you joined, you felt in your initial you know, sort of inculcation, if you will, mm -hmm. that you sensed the company was at an inflection point. Mm -hmm. um, and I've sensed that as well with a lot of companies I've talked to over the last year or so, that there seems mm -hmm. to be a shift occurring. And that shift has something to do with a renewed sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think, as you point out, Rich, it is as much driven by an awareness that there is a new set of consumers making demands that have as much to do with, okay, keep this price where it's, you know, keep the price where the price near needs to be. Mm -hmm. But that's table stakes. Mm -hmm. Now show me that you align with my values, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
are you guys seeing that shift as well? Absolutely. And, and, and is that, is leaning into that shift a good marketing strategy? Absolutely. So, gosh, it's probably eight years ago now. We recognize that the intersection of technology and society is where we've operated, whether it was developing the social security system, putting people on the moon or whatever it may be. And, and then we realized that we had to have some very specific solutions for markets in different industries. So we put a wrapper around that, and it's very much a brand and sustainability conversation, and we called it Smarter Planet. And in doing so, we did a, we did a few things. First of all, we changed the conversation about technology to about how you could improve industries, lives of individuals, whatever. And in doing so, the conversation could be it's, it's improved efficiency, it's reduced fuel costs, it's less time wasted, whatever it may be. We started it further by taking it down to the city level. And in developing these initiatives, it became very clear that there was good being done. And it was imperative we did this, not because there was good being done, because you know I think of the old Moneyball story, I don't know if you know the use of data to change a business in baseball, and Brad Pitt was the star, the star and he said, adapt or die. And we had to change the model and the way we went about going to market to meet the demands that people were placing upon us, which was for less cost, improved efficiency, new capabilities, all at the same time at a price point we've come to expect, to your point. So we changed the conversation to be about not fast computers or really smart services people, but to be about smarter planet and the ability for individuals to associate that, not just businesses, right? We sell to businesses, but they're all, they all have people in them. For people to relate to that was a, a, a very huge uh, inflection point for us. Mm -hmm. And are you seeing something similar? Um, I mean, your business, was there an, is there an inflection? I mean, you've been around now for 25 years. Yeah. Is, is the world tacking to where you've always been? Yeah. I, I, I think there's definitely a trend to where we are. Um, if you look at the categories we compete, I mean, we compete in probably the least sexy, least sexiest categories that are out there in the supermarket, right? Laundry detergent, dish soap, toilet paper. Um, and you look across those categories, those are like zero to one to two percent growth categories in a great year. And our business and, you know, frankly, the, the more eco-friendly options are growing in double digits. It's the only part of the, of the market that is growing. Double digits in that category, in those categories? Yeah, in the categories okay. we compete in. Right. You know, our brands are growing and our products are growing in, you know, well into the double digits. Because consumers are finding, I think, two things. One, um, that we make products that work really well. Um, not everybody does, but you know, when you make products that work really well, they don't buy them just once, they buy them a second time. And second, that the people really want to align with values when they're making a purchase choice. I mean, we did some really good um, research in really trying to understand what role our mission plays in actually driving growth in our business. And it sounds totally intuitive in hindsight, but we can see a significantly higher level of purchase interest and loyalty amongst people who understand our mission compared to people who are just buying our products. You know, and they're buying in to the why we do what we do and the change that we're trying to create in the world. So let's get back to that Guinness example because there's this thing that you, you guys have educated me on called the say-do paradox, right? Which is people say they want to buy you know, sustainable products and that they think that's a good idea. Then they say they're even willing to pay a little bit more for it. Yeah. But there's a raft of research showing that that's just simply not true. And if you're a brand manager advocating to, to try to, you know, tack your particular brand into the sustainable, um, you know, shift, you need data to, to prove. And, and quite frankly, it's hard to come by. You can find lots of data saying people will say they will, but it's harder to find the data to show that there's a lift because of it. Is this a failure of marketing or is it just that it's really hard to have that 15 minute conversation with the customer? I think there's two things going on. Um, so I think people overclaim how loyal they will be to products or brands or companies based on sustainability. So I, I think that, that that's true to a degree. Um, I think our business would be probably about 10 times higher if, you know, if, if that was right, you know, if completely, everyone completely said true. They, if everyone did what they said, you'd, you'd be as big as Tide. Exactly. But, you know, so that's for sure. <laughs> um, that said, we run a 
pretty sophisticated marketing mix model with IRI where we take a look at all of the different things we did over the last two years. And they look at the activity week by week, and they look at sales week by week. They look at it geography by geography, and they're able to run a regression analysis that shows what activity drives what growth. And there's really two things we were looking for. One was return on investment. Um, so which activities you know, give us the best return? Um, and then the second thing was what's having the biggest impact on the business? So when you run an activity, you know, what's driving growth? And the piece that really you know, blew my mind when we ran this this past year was we saw a single ad we ran in the New York Times um, run on one day on Sunday in the New York Times, delivered the highest ROI that we've seen. That wasn't necessarily so surprising, but it delivered a greater impact on our business than all of the couponing that we had done over the, over the course of the prior year. And the ad was, and it basically it was these toxin freedom fighters standing up um, and asking people to sign a petition for greater transparency, for um, toxic chemical reform in the US, which is a, a huge issue that we really believe in. We weren't selling products. We weren't talking about our products. We were talking about the issue. Mm -hmm. And it drove our business like nothing else that we've done. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that, you know, that's you know, quantitative proof that people do care. Can I chime in on, on this? And you know, again, I, I, I qualify that I'm not, I'm not a marketer, um, but there's you know, data and decision making. To me, those two things are, are interconnected. People often ask me, you know, like, what makes a good sustainability strategist or what makes a good strategist? And I say it's that person who can, from that small kernel of information, see and extrapolate the big picture, right? But I, I kind of think that that's strategy of the past. Intuitive strategy, there are very few people who are really going to outperform those who have good data can analyze it effectively and make quick decisions. And now with tools such as what IBM is developing, you can do that, and or people will as they adopt it, of course, right? And connect with their consumers quickly and the rest of it. And, and I want to connect it back to the notion of values and brand. And there's some work, and I'm, I'm going to plug for my former colleagues at PwC. I think the smartest piece of work that I have seen in the last 10 years is a product that they have developed called Tim. Total Impact Measurement and Management. And what it does is it actually identifies along four pillars, the environmental, social, economic, and tax implications of a decision for the qualities of its product. Some of you might remember the Puma environmental scorecard that came out a number of years ago. It was actually quite a big splash. A lot of people are very interested. This is the evolution that's gone far beyond that. But what, they have actually, what they're actually able to do with this system is identify the net value created or destroyed based on a particular decision. And if you think about the social dimensions, health in the case of Nestle, uh, an environmental aspect in the case of Seven Generation, that kind of data and decision making can inform your decision making as a company, whether you're a brand manager or a strategist or other, but also as a consumer. Having that sort of information, because you said you, know, you don't have 10 or 15 minutes, but with a tool like this, you do have an instantaneous snapshot of green-red, environmentally, socially, and economically, and in this case also for if you're a corporation, the tax aspects, you can see the value created or destroyed. And so if my value is I want to make sure everything I'm doing is going to create net value for the planet, and I really care about greenhouse gas reduction because climate change is my number one issue, and I see that that product is doing it, I may be, in fact, compelled. I do think it's going to require more definitive data. I do think you're absolutely right. That draw, drew a, your example is a very authentic act that creates loyalty and understanding and compassion, and that drives people to a product for sure. I, I think it'll be great to see how long that can, you know, how you take it to the next level, like any company, right? Yeah. But I, I think it's, a, it's an important one just to make that connection again between data, decision making, influencing consumers and then making sure you understand their values and how you can reflect that in such a way that they can make that decision rapidly. And, and Rich, you were talking at, at lunch about, um, what was it, uh, early decisions and late decisions? Early learn and late learn. Early learn and late learn. Right. Yeah. People that are inspecting purchasing decisions and considering purchases they may wish to make can do most of the research on their own without ever leaving, I will say their home, but in reality without ever leaving their phone, right? and they'll become informed consumers long before they ever show up at a store. And they'll do a lot of analysis and they'll look at the ratings of various people. My uh, 
posted. And, and you, you become so much more informed. Uh, I just thought of this, as you mentioned, the experience of buying a car used to be one of the most wretched things imaginable. Yeah. Because you never really knew what to pay. And now everybody walks in and they know what to pay. It's, the whole conversation's changed. You can just if order. If they're even buying a car. If they're even buying it. Well, <laughs> we talked about leasing. Yeah, fair enough. But the, but the point is, it's just archaic. Right. And, and the data is available for just about everything. So, for example, you could find uh, anything you want to know uh, about a popular brand. Uh, and the brand can, too. So let's just take it out of you know something that's critically important, but something everybody knows. Take Netflix or AMC. AMC changed their business model to create their own programming. The, walk, the Walking Dead, Mad Men, um, Breaking Bad, all these shows, because the model they had before redistributing old films was no good. So in doing so, they changed the way people watch. They changed behavior. And now everybody's streaming, and they're whipping through the ads, and the advertising dollars, all of a sudden, I can't charge for this many viewers because only this many people are watching the ads. But they have enough data with the help of IBM running some analytics capabilities so they know where to put the pod and where to put the commercial uh, promotion in the middle of the commercial pod. And people come out of fast forward and they watch. And the next thing you know, advertising revenues went up $10 million a month. Now, as I said, that's not curing cancer, although we are with Watson. Yeah. It's, it's an important example of the data is there and it's changing, it's changing behavior. And just one last point on that. We, reach, we recently bought the weather company. And everybody said, what and why? Well, first of all, we're pretty good at managing large amounts of data and getting insight out of it. These people took 26 billion hits in one day on their site during uh, Hurricane Sandy, I guess it was. And they are now able to take that data and in conjunction with what IBM is doing and utilize that basically weather and locality to affect every industry. So energy and utilities companies is now uh, in, in, with the ability to predict storms down to you know, an area the size of this seating area, uh, are able to do all sorts of predictive and preventive maintenance. But you can imagine the effects weather has if you have the proper information on travel and transportation, mm -hmm. or theme parks, or sporting events, or commodities training. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, this data, which perhaps was even deemed a little bit superficial or fleeting, now becomes the, the crown jewels for many industries, and, and that's what's happening. I have a question of scale, and I, Joey, I want to ask you this question because it, it struck me that uh, obviously, I mean, I think a presumption of business, at least sort of the muscular American post-war capitalism uh, version of business, is that it must grow. It must take more profit. It must increase shareholder value. It must bigger till it's as big as it could possibly be. Um, if you could wave a magic wand and seventh generation got as big as it could possibly get. Mm. Are there impediments to your scale because of supply chain and the ecosystem? You know, are there enough materials to get as big as you'd like? Or are you constrained by the reality of the market? No, I don't, I don't think we're, I wish I had that problem, by the way. Um, <laughs> I kind of wish you did too. Yeah. Um, no, I don't. I don't. I don't see a um, constraints around scale. I mean, we use natural products. We use recycled goods. Um, you know, we'll compete for more recycled plastic for doing packaging um, over time. But um, you know, there's more and more recycling every year. So you know, there's a pretty good stream of recycling for making packaging. You know, actually, I think our, our products are way more sustainable and way more scalable because we're using natural instead of petro-based sources to actually making the ingredients. So, you know, all of our ingredients are totally renewable. Um, so, as we look at the business, you know, we can you know easily see how we can scale that over time. So, economies start to kick in in a way for you at a certain scale. Yeah, exactly. You know, and right now we've got a really interesting model. We have over twenty-five different suppliers, so we don't. Um, we don't manufacture ourselves. We work with contract manufacturers that are spread around, um, largely the US, a little bit in Canada. Um, and that's pretty much it. And that's more efficient because we can produce to our scale and close to the market that we're selling in. Um, as the business grows over time, could there be an opportunity for us to, to build a factory to make our stuff? Sure. Um, but we take a, t a look at the total life cycle of everything that we create, and we would factor in the um, the efficiency of shipping, for example, if we were to have a single location, you know, all of a sudden our shipping efficiencies would completely shift. 
Right. Um, so I think the model is, is very scalable because it's so dispersed, actually. Um, I, I want to allow for this uh, talk box to get tossed about. Um, I'm not sure where it is, but uh, I think somebody's got it. And if you can get it out into the audience, that would be great, because I want you guys to join this conversation. We have a, about 10 minutes left, um, if I'm doing the time right here. Um, and while we think about that, I want to ask a question. You know, there's been a number of high-profile acquisitions by very large companies that have sort of gotten their sustainability on you know, by buying Ben and Jerry's or buying Burt's Bees or buying a sustainable brand. So a sort of two-part question here, is that a strategy that um, large companies, you know, will continue with, do you think? Um, and what's your price, Joey? <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to start with that? Yeah. Well, I'm just curious, do you have a point of view at the company about that? You've watched your yeah. neighbor in Vermont go to oh, Unilever sure. and, and, and probably quite successfully from what I can tell. Yeah. I mean, I, my view is the, um, the, the bigger companies like ours can get, the greater the good is that we do. Um, so growth creates value and you know, enables us to deliver our mission in a much bigger way. You know, for, oops. <laughs> um, for us as a company, we're privately held. We've got um, very patient capital. It's mostly funded by individual family firms that have been in the business, in, in our business, for about 15 years or so. And they have absolutely no interest in selling out. Um, we just brought in Al Gore's uh, generation fund. Um, they made a pretty substantial investment in us uh, last August, a year ago August. Yeah, I was amazed when they were, when you know, we were working through all of the economics with them. They ran a 40-year uh, return model on their investment. I, I was never heard of anybody doing a 40-year model. Um, but they looked at our business and they said it's about long-term growth. And um, I'm not sure that there'd be a big company that would want to buy us. Um, as we think about our future, it's just how do we continue to grow? And you know, we've got loads of people who are interested in putting more capital into the business to help it grow. And, that's our path. I think growth, and, and, and you kind of alluded to it, I think growth is um, something that comes organically, of course, or through acquisition. But growth for growth's sake isn't necessarily, isn't necessarily important. So our company is smaller than it was five years ago, by a lot. By the way, there are a lot of people that aren't very happy about that, just to be fair. But <laughs> that said, they're extremely more profitable spinning off things that weren't profitable. And that's just almost an arbitrage thing, you could argue. But in doing so, we're continuing to enhance the brand and, and, and the things that we find are changing society. So in this conversation about data, there's all this structured data, and then there's unstructured data. It's video, it's images. And we just bought a company that has the largest inventory of healthcare images in the world. And what we're doing is we're saying, OK, these x-rays, these MRIs can be put to use by our Watson technology and analyze in ways that will increase the confidence level of a certain diagnosis based on a certain man of a certain age with a certain history. And the doctor gets that information and is able to make much more informed decisions about a treatment plan. So to us, that's the kind of acquisition that will make. It will advance our societal goals, but it will advance what it is that we're up to. And in doing that, I think you end up always constantly morphing yourself forward mm -hmm. and ensuring that you do nothing to harm the brand at the same time, right? So you enhance the brand, you continue to, you know, I mean, not to get all egalitarian, but to seriously improve the lives of the people that you're s selling to. And so those are the kind of acquisitions that we make to help us inform the data and to get insights to deliver you know, products that people want and, and will be loyal or loyal to or advocate mm -hmm. for. We've got a, a, a microphone here and a hand over there. Oh, and a hand here and then one in the center here. Hi, thank you so much for a great discussion. Very strange to uh, talk into a box. My name is Alex and I'm from Supply Shift and uh, we deal with supply chains. And my question to you is, at this point, brands don't control what may happen in terms of their reputation and in terms of their message completely because most of the things, especially you know, with somebody like Seventh Generation where you have contract manufacturers and things we've seen 
major scandals and disasters coming out from supply chains. So how does a brand control messaging an image when a brand does not, in fact, in most cases, is not fully vertically integrated? And how do you deal with that aspect of messaging and branding when it's not in complete 100% direct your control? Thank you. Yeah. I mean, for, for us, we keep very close tabs on the manufacturers that we work with. So we've got very strong partnerships. They're long, you know, long lasting partnerships. Um, w they produce products to our formula. So we have our own in-house R&D team. Um, in fact, we've got some amazing scientists. The guy who leads our science invented Fantastic in 409. Um, the guy who's our lead engineer has thousands of patents from his time at Kimberly Clark. So really high quality R&D work going on in our shop. And our contract manufacturers are making exactly to our specifications, and we're really rigorous about checking the quality. I know exactly what you're saying because I've also, you know, seen brands who find out, you know, six years into a relationship that actually the contract manufacturer is not making what they thought they were making. But that's because they fall asleep at the wheel. I think you have to stay close. You have to do constant quality audits and make sure that you're building a partnership and a relationship. It's not just a uh, it's not just a transactional relationship where they're supplying product and you just hope for the best. Mm -hmm. But Th that's things will go totally wrong. Important. Things will go wrong, and I think it's equally important is how you respond. Because uh, let's take what was it, Johnson and Johnson, the Tylenol scandal years or it's just scandal, I guess, the Tylenol deaths years ago, uh, could have debilitated that company, and instead they responded so proactively that actually people became impressed with the way they responded, how they handled, how they changed the packaging. They took it all off the shelf, cost them a fortune. But so it's almost like if you can't fix it, feature it, right? They ended up responding in such a way that the brand became stronger because things do go wrong. So I, I believe that as well, um, you have to have rigorous controls. And then how you respond to something uh, will really dictate whether or not the brand you know, survives or well, it's hurt or not. Mm -hmm. the question here. Hi. Yeah, so I'm your millennial, um, and I'm sort of the purpose-driven person. Uh, but my question is sort of like with bigger corporations, like with Unilever, um, how do you keep transparent of like the fact that one corporation owns so many brands? Because most people often know the brands, but they don't actually know um, that one brand owns so many things. And how do you keep that consistency, right? Because like Ben & Jerry's, now they switch back to like all fair trade and everything. But that doesn't mean that Unilever produces other products that sort of have the same, you know, values really. Like seventh generation, it's very consistent and clear throughout all of your products. Um, so how do you like balance and math? How can you say that you're a sustainable company um, if you kind of like because all of your brands are sort of their individual mm. DNA almost, mm -hmm. like they are their own brands. I, I'm, I'm happy to. Uh to respond to that. So first of all, it's a great question. And there's a, there was actually a few questions in there. But I'm gonna, the one I'm going to pull out is, you know, when you are a diversified company that has a multitude of products and brands under a banner, how do you maintain that consistency, that, that, th that, that, that thesis or, or of, of sustainability? Is that your question? Well, I mean, the first is that um, the, the, the truth is you can't. You can't expect that it is going to be 100% consistent across everything. Every brand, one brand may have been from an acquisition, another brand might be from something else. And the fact is, is that they'll all have different systems for quite some time, they'll have different processes and policies and all sorts of things, and it takes time to integrate them. So time is the great healer in that, first of all. The second is, is that you will have different levels of integration of various things, whether it's sustainability or other, with every brand, depending on the proposition of that brand, mm -hmm. depending on the purpose of that product or the service. So those are all the pieces that have to be considered. So in, in my role, in which there are a number of brands in the company, which is a subsidiary of the bigger company, um, I have to make that consideration as well. So whether it's a regional spring water, or a premium spring water, or it's a tea product, or whatever it is, I'm trying to understand, and what Nestle certainly does, and I see it happening across all of them, is what is that one common denominator, or two, or more, that can be distributed across the organization with all the brands. And what I have found from my experience, and not just at Nestle, but you know, having consulted to many companies over the years, 
is the value is not just in trying to find a common denominator that fits for everybody, but it's about finding the combination of denominators so that people can choose the pieces that work for them and come from the same decision point or the same uh, objective, which is, in this case, to create net value, to provide a shared value proposition for every product. We will, we will go so far as to take this as a, a brand stewardship challenge. <laughs> Thus, every company we buy, even if it keeps its name for a short period of time or a long period of time, will say, an IBM company. And then they have to adhere to the brand, even the way it's displayed, even the way it's marketed. And it's probably a little bit overbearing for a new company to have to comply with that. But that brand is the only one that matters to us. There's fantastic companies we've bought. The weather company is a fantastic company. It will say an IBM company because of a lot of things that they'll be doing. Well, one, I want people to know about. And two, that's the identity that keeps it, that, that's the uh, connective tissue across everything we do. Now that's not something that every brand can do, particularly in consumer products, I would say, because you know, Procter & Gamble makes a living out of filling up the entire shelf, right? So they can't say it's all the same thing. But it, it, brand stewardship is, is, is probably the most critical thing that you can do there, as long as you have, again, good, you know, good measurements and practices. If I can build on that, I think the piece I build where I, where I see companies doing it really well is they get their own house in order. So they get the corporate house in order. And if sustainability is important to the, to the company itself, and Unilever is actually a great example. They're probably one of the most progressive of the, the, the big multinational package goods companies. You know, they have sustainability throughout, you know, throughout, as a core principle throughout the business that they do. Um, I, I, when you've got the house in order, then I think the brands can build on that and tell stories about what they're doing in a way that is really meaningful and, you know, frankly, more defensible. If, if the house isn't in order and it's just a marketing gimmick on one single brand, then it's going to fall apart like a cheap suit. Mm -hmm. You know, because consumers know. I mean, they know everything that goes on. Yeah, and I think it took Unilever actually a little while to figure that out. They're doing some really interesting stuff on Dove and then attacked by Greenpeace for their corporate practices. Like, are you kidding me? Um, and so I think that, that a lot of companies have learned lessons like that. But getting the house in order first before you turned it into a marketing platform is absolutely critical, because otherwise it's not authentic. You know, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And it's, it's an excellent point. There's, there's three steps that we follow at Nestle, for example, and, and I would argue that Nestle's ahead of Unilever in that, but that's fine. <laughs> but there, there's three steps, and the first one is really clean your house. Number one, make sure you understand what your compliance obligations are, what your risks are, and, and make sure that you're addressing those, but also where are your impacts and so on. The next is understanding who your stakeholders are, what's important to them, and what the impacts of your products and services and operations are to them not just environmentally, but to them as well, as the, from a perception. And the third, then, is develop the programs and the partnerships that can complement all of the things you're trying to achieve from a brand perspective, from a product perspective, from a sales and profit perspective, so that you can reach that end goal, as I, I keep echoing, about creating net value, creating shared value. Uh, you, you just described um, internet.org from Facebook. And, and, and what I mean by that is like there is an example of, I mean, I'm trying to keep it away just so to, to make a point, of a company that wants to do good. They want to give everybody internet connectivity around the world who doesn't have it. Mm -hmm. And they came up with internet.org and they rolled it out in India and they got their butt handed to them. Mm -hmm. Because it was seen as this big corporation going in in their own interest to give everyone a phone that had Facebook on it. Right. right? And, and I think about that again when, I, when you just laid that out, right, and, and made me think about your uh, uh, water education for teachers program. All this amazing good work you do is so easy to mock and say, all you're just trying to do is get everyone to learn about how they should be drinking water so you can sell it to them. How do you get past that? It, it's a great question. And on that, I am yet to see or hear anybody in the company say, we've got to get people drinking more water from our bottles. What we talk about is that healthy hydration is key. Whether it comes from a bottle or a tap does not matter to us. We want clean, healthy, accessible water for all. 
this is just another beverage. And I think that that's a common misconception, a misunderstanding about the fact that this is, this is water in a bottle as opposed to something that has other ingredients added to it. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a difficult one because I think people see it in you know, many different lights. Um, but you're right, and, and the challenge is not one that certainly we shy away from in any respect. I think what I'm seeing is the complete company doubling and tripling down on these things. Mm -hmm. Some of the work that we have been working on and, and that I'm directly involved in right now, I really think is going to change uh, a lot of the way people, I'm not talking about perceived Nestle, I'm talking about the way they understand our resources the limitations of our resources and the opportunities that lie within. Anyway, I read about it soon. <laughs> Got a question over here. Uh, yes, um, I, I'm a director of the Globe Foundation, but I also own my own brand and communications company. So this is addressed to you, Joy. Being from Vermont, yeah. you, you're also home of Green Mountain, who also produce Keurig. So you're talking about 10 billion of these pods. Yeah. It's a convenience factor. It's not even necessarily a price factor. I'm just wondering how you, as a business branding company, would address something like the Keurig. Well, we would find a way to, um, to make those pods recyclable. We'd probably, well, actually, I have a better answer than that, um, because we actually wouldn't create the pods. We bought a, um, a company about a, two years ago or so. Um, so Bobble, this you know, aligns with our mission. We've created this, this unit called Seven Generation Ventures to identify other brands that fit with our mission around sustainability. You know, this one's about eliminating, I'm sorry about this, <laughs> you know, the waste of water I'm bottles. I'm just happy to see you <laughs> hydrating. I'm just hydrating. Um, <laughs> well said. Very good. Um, and so that was one of the first acquisitions that we made and you know, fits, with our, fits with our mission because we think that people should just reuse a bottle. Um, you know, tap water for the most part across North America is safe. Not in Michigan apparently and you know, obviously there's um, many places where there's real tragedy and, you know, and bottled water is a necessity in those cases. But for the most part, we've got safe tap water and we should use it. We also bought a, um, a company, a much smaller company um, called uh, well, they made a product called Impress, um, which was a on-the-go coffee solution where you can make fabulous coffee, like the best coffee ever, um, in a, you know, it, just in a single unit that you then take with you on the go. Again, it's, it's, a, it's a way to make it easy to make coffee, to have it on the go, to address that convenience issue without necessarily creating waste along the way. And that's really the way that we approach all of the problems that you know, we're trying to go after and solve. You know, how can you do it in a way that's sustainable, that eliminates or reduces waste? Mm -hmm. And, and I'll, I, I'm going to chalk one more piece in and then move on to the next question. And I appreciate it wasn't directed at me. <laughs> <laughs> but the notion really is about, I think, closing the loop. I mean, a lot of people talk about this notion. But really, you know, if you are going to design a product like that, taking those things into account prior to, um, you know, what is going to be the impact? What is going to be the life cycle of this? And it's determinate. And if you know where it is and where you can drive that wedge so that you can close that loop and you can bring that product back. And I'm not talking about downcycling. I'm not talking about you know, a product that can only be used a certain number of times. I'm talking about truly closing the loop so it is an endless cycle. I think that's something that anybody who's producing products really needs to consider. Over here. Hi. Um, I was just hoping you, all of you could talk a little bit more about your experiences instead of just looking at the consumer as a one homogeneous unit, but the kind of cleavages among consumers. So um, whether gender, so men or women or millennials um, and baby boomers or people in rural communities and urban and even, like you said, in the Indian case, I'm from Brazil and there is even sometimes a perception, right, of, of oh, this is a first world problem. They don't know what we need. So how do you deal with this sort of uh, vision and perception and people who really buy the products? Who, who are these from a more segmented perspective? That's a great question. So it's a, probably a little more of a challenge for us at some level because we're not necessarily selling, IBM isn't necessarily selling to consumers at all any longer. Uh, I think the the only answer that I would have for that, and it's how we run the business, is we're actually running the business with people 
on the ground in the places where we do business. We don't run the business from you know, our headquarters in Armonk, New York, obviously. <laughs> the people in Armonk, New York truly believe they run the business, but when it, comes to, <laughs> when it comes to sales and delivery, we do it locally. And we have centers around the world, and we have service people around the world, and we have sales people around the world. And the only way that, uh, and we develop campaigns very specifically that are aligned with the demographics of where it is that we're selling. So if we, as the global marketing leader, I might say, okay, we want to do a campaign around improving customer experience for our telecommunications and utilities clients. Well, we can't design it much more than saying, here's you know, some high level value propositions and here's some you know, important differentiation. After that, we give it to our people in the geographies, in Brazil, in India, and then they develop the campaign to connect with the local market. And that, that's precisely the, the, the same case uh, as I'm understanding it more and more. You know, there are regional products and there are national products or international products and brands. And, but for the most part, it's the same sort of methodology where the, the high level brand proposition is there and it's set, whether it's segmented by, uh, by, by you know, the category types or the types of consumer and so on. Uh, but really, you know, one of the things that I'm seeing Nestle, certainly Nestle Waters do very well is from a regional perspective. Local brands, they're, they're called regional spring waters because they service a region. You don't have Arrowhead in, uh, in New England, right? Arrowhead, this is California, West Coast, right? In New England, you've got Poland Springs, which is coming right there from Poland Springs in Maine for like the last 121 years or something like that. And so understanding the local market and that context uh, is the most important thing. If you want to be, again, authentic in your brand, that notion of sustainability in mind, because again, local has become part of the sustainability story for, for, for right or wrong. So all of those things have to come into play. So th the corporate level sort of objective or direction, but execution and understanding the local market can only be done by those who actually exist in the local market. And same with each segment of the consumer. You need to understand who that segment of the consumer is and so consult with them. From a, for us, from a consumer standpoint, we find that consumers who are interested in, you know, in our brand and sustainability actually cut across multiple demographics. And the best leading indicators for us is it's kind of a path to purchase that we call in me, on me, and around me. So people tend to make their way into natural products first in the foods that they eat because that's really the most personal. Um, there's a big movement, obviously, to natural and organic foods, and that's you know has been explosive. Then the things that they put on them, personal care products. So your skin absorbs 65% of whatever you put on it. So people are starting to think about what are the chemicals that they're applying to their skin because it's going to make their way its way into um, into the bloodstream. And then around me, and that's where most of our brands or most of our products um, actually play. And so as we talk to consumers, we try to help bring them along that that. Um, knowledge and adoption curve. That's, that's really been one of the, the biggest guiding insights for us. The second thing has been um, new moms. So when you're having a baby for the first time, you're really thinking, I mean, your world's changing, right? And you're bringing this you know, kind of wonderful you know, human into the world, and you're rethinking everything that goes into the house, everything that you're using around, um, you're using around that baby. And oftentimes, people clean up the house, and they will, you know, bring in a whole new set of products that they will use, not just for the baby, but for the whole family. That's a really important um, switch point, if you will. And then the third thing that I find really interesting is, um, and we see this when, when we do advertising and, um, and try to read um, where we're seeing the greatest response, we have a huge response amongst single women under the age of 30 in, with income under $75,000. So you know, basically college grads. Um, before they've married largely, um, they've come out of college, they are just, again, thinking about their house and they're setting it up, and their values are just different from their mom's values, and they're trying to set up and start up in a way that's very different from them. And so those are really kind of like the three different things that we've been using as we've been thinking about how we approach consumers, and then beyond that, um, you know, we're really well developed across the board, ethnically, uh, male, female, all of, you know, none of that is really necessarily a, a differentiator for us. 
Well, I want to be aware, aware of your time out there. We're over the time that the session was set for, but we also started a little late, but we're at exactly an hour. So I think that's a good time to end it. And please join me. Oh, is there one more? OK, absolutely, one more. I didn't see that box over there. Thank you. It's uh, Jeff from Staples. So I realized that you're all brand owners. You have your own brands, but often you also partner with retailers to make sure that you sell your products. So in that case, how, what is the role of retailers? And how do brand owners and retailers partner to change customer behavior? The role of Wonder. retailers? The, the role of retailers. And, okay. and it with an easy one. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I, I wouldn't pretend to be an expert to answer that question. I, I'd, I'd love to be able to. I can tell you things that we are doing in terms of trying to build partnerships with retailers and, other, and others uh, to enhance our ability to, 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 to move forward collective action around creating shared value. That's where I spend more of my time than on the brand proposition side of it. Um, so I don't think I can really speak to it. Well, if you'd like, at the end, if you give me your card, I will certainly connect you with our, our, our head of brand who I'm sure would Chew your ear off if you'd like on the topic. So, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Did you want to talk? Well, I was going to say is there's 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 two aspects to this, and, and it's about partnership for us. Uh, again, you're not buying a lot of IBM products retail uh, any longer, um, but we have a massive array of business partners around the world who we who we use as a channel, and there's a certain set of guidelines and standards, and they have to certify and all of those things. And, and that's a, a quid pro quo in terms of you know, treating each other well, but ensuring that standards are met, everybody can benefit, everybody can get value. But the other partnership, and I'll give one example of this quickly, is we'll partner with people that have the ability to offer something to extend our reach. So for example, we have a partnership with Apple. And we have over 100 applications, and it'll continue to grow, very specific to industries where we know, for example, field workers in utilities can be much more efficient if on their iPad or on the device that they use all the time, not some created device that the company gives them, uh, they have the ability to access all of the data about a particular aspect of the network. Uh, and, and it can minimize time, and it can minimize costs, and it can minimize truck rolls, and all of those things. Uh, what we've done is we've reached them where they spend their time but we've reached them in a way that's productive for us and more productive for them as well. So my answer would be it, it's about having equitable and, and, and high quality partnerships. And I, by the way, we have one with Staples. <laughs> Only we buy from you. <laughs> I, I would completely agree with that. So partnership with retailers is, has been critical to our business growth. Um, one of the best examples um, is an American example, um, not a Canadian example, but Target. Um, cause Target Canada hasn't been so good, I guess. Um, Target US is a different story that's been you know, you know, a tremendous retailer. And we've really partnered very closely with them as they developed a program called Made to Matter. So they put together a group in the first year of about 16 or 17 different brands that were all um, better for you brands, if you will, that cut across the whole store. So there was cleaning brands and food brands and um, yeah, a, um, a, whole, a whole vast array of multi-categories all united under this banner of Made to Matter. Um, and we've worked very closely with Target in that example in developing a program, helping them identify who should be in that kind of a program and who shouldn't be, giving them, helping them work through screening criteria. Um, we're working with them right now um, in category management. They, they named us one of their uh, category managers in wellness, which is one of their four key planks across the store, so not just in the categories we compete in, but to help them identify um, standards on labeling so that you know, as a consumer there's a level of transparency where you know what goes into the products that, um, that you're buying. Um, and our best relationships and our best, you know, our strongest businesses are with those retailers who are really trying to evolve their business and reach those consumers who are concerned about sustainability and looking for help in doing that. And that's where we've seen the greatest growth. With similar experiences with Amazon, um, Whole Foods has been a long-term partner. Um, it, it, where there's a partnership, we see real growth, and where there's not, actually, we, you know, we get stuck on the bottom shelf below tide. <laughs> That's not so good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, now, please join me in thanking this panel, and thank you for coming today. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Thank you.